都已经坏了，你修了也没有用。对呀。都已经坏了，你修了也没有用。对呀，对。都已经坏了，你修了也没有用。对呀、啊，对。Hi, very good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live panel discussion on this topic of understanding mental challenges faced by youth, brought to you by the Youth Alliance. My name is Bing Siu. I'm the founder and executive director of Campus I, a youth mental health nonprofit organization, and the co chair of Youth Alliance. Uh, and I will be your moderator for today. The Youth Alliance is a network of agencies that share a common interest in addressing issues of mental health. It is catalyzed by the National Council of Social Service co-led by Campus Line Limited and Touch Community Services and consists of government agencies such as Health Promotion Board, healthcare agencies like Community Health Assessment Team, social service agencies like the EMTFSC, and the Institutes of Higher Learning like Singapore Polytechnic, the Masik Polytechnic, and the Singapore Institute of Technology. Through today's candid dialogue between our youth, Gen Z and millennials, parents and mental health professionals, we hope to shed light on youth's perspectives and their take on mental health issues as well as to enlighten parents and caregivers to enable them to provide better support to youths who may be in distress. Before we start, let me share some key national statistics in the youth mental health space in Singapore. Based on the Singapore Mental Study 2016 conducted by IMH, youths aged between 18 to 34 years old were presented as the most vulnerable group. One in five would have experienced a mental health disorder in the lifetime. It was also found that the majority of people, more than three in four, which is about 75%, with a mental health disorder in their lifetime, did not seek any mental professional help. Okay. Although the study did not investigate reasons for not seeking treatment in detail, past research have found that the inability to recognize the symptoms of mental health issues and concerns regarding stigma associated with mental illness are two common reasons for treatment delay in mental health disorders. The National Council of Social Service 2017 study on attitudes towards persons with mental health conditions in Singapore found that 7 in 10 Singaporeans believe that persons with mental health conditions experience stigma and discrimination daily. 6 in 10 Singaporeans believe that mental health conditions are caused by a lack of self-discipline and willpower, and that if you have a mental health condition, you can will yourself to get better. Our recent poll findings from Campus Site during Circuit Breaker also shows that there is a general decline in youth mental well-being uh, age 16 to 34 during COVID-19. And the top three stresses are uncertainty over their future finances, struggles with home-based learning, and work from home arrangements. Thirdly, the social isolation. With me today, we have a lovely panel comprising of youths representing the Generation Z, millennials, parents, and mental health professionals to share with us their thoughts on the mental health challenges on the mental health challenges that you face today and how can we better support them in their journey. Without further ado, can we have our esteemed panelists on a round of self-introduction? Alice, please. Hi, very good evening to all of you um, who's watching over from Facebook Live. Uh, my name is my name is Sok Nin. I'm actually a counsellor with Temasek Poly. And so very happy to be joining you this evening. Uh, hi. Uh, Hi, this is uh, Guy Priya. I'm a senior lecturer with Tamasic Polytechnic and a mom to Anand, a 16-year-old at Tamasic Junior College. 
thank you and i'm it's a pleasure to be here with you all hi hey hi guys thank you for joining us on the last session right yes we are the very last session for beyond label so thank you for joining this dialogue i'm sylvia chan from night owl cinematics <laughs> i'm the co-founder and um i think this is uh the second year that we, uh, i'm doing beyond mm. the label festival this time is virtual so thank you for joining in and we hope that uh, this session will prove insightful for you and we hope you walk away with something new Hi, I'm Grant. I'm from SP. I'm a peer supporter there. I'm currently in year one and I'm studying in the Diploma in Media and Communication. Okay. Thanks, panelists, for the quick introduction. For the quick introduction. So, online viewers, at any point in time, if you have any burning questions for the panel, do feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section on our Facebook Live below. Yeah. <laughs> and we will try our best to answer them during the session. Correct. Yeah, okay. Mm. Suvin, Gwen, mm. uh, as a millennial and Gen Z, what are some of the common stresses that you and your peers face as youth and young adults? Okay, before we get into the question, right? Yeah. You know, do Facebook Live, you must tell them to, and you must like and share, yeah? You must comment, <laughs> you must like and share. Yeah, I'm Ming Hui, Nick, BB, I'm looking at you, like and share. Uh, Gwen, you answer first. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay, uh, sorry for the question. <laughs> okay, right, right. Uh, as a millennial and Gen Z, what are some of the common stresses that you and your peers face as youth and young adults? Okay, I mean, um, talking to some of my friends, uh, the common themes that, you know, they mention about are, you know, stress about school and, you know, relationship issues with their friends and family. And for me, I mean, stepping into a new year, I'm a year one in SP right now. Mm -hmm. So the polytechnic environment is very different from that of the secondary school one and you know going there it's a little stressful not being not seeing familiar faces so it's kind of for me what stresses me out now is seeing how i fit into this new environment this new um way of you know going to school and all this yeah sylvia sylvia right no i think that's the thing right when we were young we also faced this kind of stress and then you think when you are older right you kind of like have it all set together. up but actually no it's a new set of problems right so as working adults you know you have your career problems and as well finance problems suddenly you realize a washing machine is eight hundred dollars <laughs> no these kind of things are stresses in life you know and then i think for a lot of people are our age right i think people are starting to get pregnant starting to start a family mm. and then there's a lot of uh, things coming in you know fam family commitments and mm. a lot of things so i think we are so used yeah, I tell you first, when you are young, you must think. Because when you get older, there's going to be more problems. So I think it's just a new set of problems that you have to deal with. And the problem never ends. Yeah. Great. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Grant, and thanks, Sylvia. Uh, so mainly, issues that youth and young adults face are like transitions. Transition from school yeah. to uh, adult responsibilities. They call it adulting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yep, in the working mm -hmm. world. So in your experience, what do you think would be helpful in supporting our youth? Who might be in distress or struggling with mental health conditions? Yeah, go ahead. You want to go first? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for me, I think there's three really important things. Yeah. Oh. First is to check out on them from time to time. Hmm. Um, some some of my friends that I know of, they are afraid to talk about their struggles because they think that you know no one cares about them. Why would someone care about what I'm going through yeah. if they are facing their own struggles, their own they're going through their own um, life and all of this. So I think it's important to go eat or whatever. So yeah, and that leads to my next thing is if you ask them how they're doing and they tell you, you know, actually I've nowadays I've been feeling a little down, a little upset. You know, it's important to mm -hmm. listen to them, be there for them. And don't feel like you need to say something in response. Um, many times when people talk about their issues, when they are opening up, they are not talking, they're not um, confiding in you to and expecting a answer, a solution for them. Many times they are just they just want someone to listen to them. They just someone they just want someone, they just want to know that someone is there for them. So yeah, that's very important. And I think the third important thing is to be aware of your words and actions. Mm. Because little things, little um, things that you say, they matter. 
the number of times people have said to me, um, hey, why are you so emo? Cheer up. Ah. Mm. You know, it's, I understand that, you know, there are good intentions behind oh, those words, but, you know, it's kind of counterintuitive because not only does it not make me feel like, not cheer me up, mm. right, it right. also makes me feel like I have to put on a front, mm, you yes. know, to act like I'm cheerful, that I'm happy. And it's actually very, it's not very healthy. Yeah. So it's really providing a non-judgmental listening ear, right? Mm, yeah. Uh, to someone who really needs help. Not really giving a lot of advice, but really listening uh, mm. to what they're sharing to actually mm. lessen their burden. Yeah. Mm. yeah Silver, what about you? Hey, so you know, for for me, right? I deal I dealt with depression when I was younger, right? And I always feel that we are really all on the right track. The fact that we all have a panelist now and beyond the label, it means that we're really spreading the awareness. Mm. And I think what is very important is really be very aware of uh you know mental health conditions yes. uh, like your mental health versus a mental health conditions i think mm. a lot of people right they tend to put them together but you can have a great mental health okay but you may have a mental health disorder because mm. i think what we have to understand is um when we have knowledge about such things we realize hey, mental health conditions our mental illness itself right it is a it is a how do i say a scientific it's a body thing right it's like right. a flu it's like a fever mm. no one can control it so i think just to answer uh, ashokan's question right how do you decide when someone is struggling just needs a push or when it's due to mental health issues right i think that's when you need to realize and that's one thing that we all need to do is more knowledge on this topic so that with more knowledge we can identify ourselves aga aga and then we check with our friends and if they also read up then you know more people can you know have a proper dialogue mm. and really find out what's wrong with a person i think that's very important rather than just say oh you're emo she's emo you know that kind of thing yeah exactly. awareness awareness mm. thanks thanks you for answering that uh, and answering ashokan's question uh hope that ashokan um uh, that that answer from uh, Silva, it's okay for you, right? <laughs> um, Silva and Gwen, what would you like to say to friends and family who would like to help and support their loved ones, but uh, do not or not sure how to? Mm. Families that like to support their loved ones. Uh. I think one thing that's quite interesting is, I think when I had a depression, right? That was 10 years ago when it was not discussed right it was still very taboo to talk about it i think my parents had a lot of problems um trying to deal with me because they don't know what they say or what they do is mm. going to like trigger mm. a reaction or something like that so i would say that um the best way is to really just be there mm. so what really helped is uh you know when they physically accompany me to my sessions mm. and really uh when i have a problem you know either one of my family they actually take turns it's quite funny because they can't handle me all the time, right? So I think they actually take turns to just be there like, okay, um, you need time. Like, you know, you want me or Mama or Coco to go out for lunch with you, mm. pick one. And then, you know, it's just being there and being, you know, like, they can't really help you because they don't know. Mm. But the fact is, they're still there. So that's very nice. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah I mean, similar to Sylvia, yeah, it's all about, you know, taking the initiative to reach out to connect to them. Um, I mean, obviously, when you try to reach out, you know, ask them how they're doing, they may not always be ready to receive that help. Mm. So I think, yeah, it's being patient. Just be patient, be there for them. Let them know that you are an avenue for support if they need it. So when, let's say that um, Scuddy got something really happen, they know how to turn to you to actually ask for help. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, mm. Sylvia and Gwen. That was so important, right? Uh, being present and just being there uh, with your friend, all your family member, all your loved one is so important, right? Many a times, uh, we just need a listening ear to actually unload our burdens and emotional stress. Mm. Thanks for that, Sylvia and Gwen. Right. Um, next up, you know, let's hear more from Sok Nin, a mental professional from Tomasic Polytechnic. She's actually a senior manager and counsellor at TP. So, Sok Nin, what should our youth do if they feel overwhelmed or in distress or think that they might be struggling with a mental health condition? What are some of the actionable steps and resources that they can seek help from? I think most importantly, um, as there, there are two questions here. I think one's about when they are feeling the stress and overwhelm. Uh, I think as, as um, Grant and both Sylvia has really said about it, it's really actually very important to talk about it and to have people to feel supporting them about it. However, saying that if people are supporting and yet they're not talking about it, then again, they are actually very entrenched 
in the situation. Um, talking about it helps. Um, enabling them to um, to talk out their problems, and when they talk out the problems, people then can give them resources. Yeah, so it's actually very important to find someone, uh, find a helpful channel to talk <laughs> on their issues. Now, when it's about a mental condition, now if anybody is really concerned about their mental condition or they are developing a mental illness, as with any illness, I think it's important to get help early. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't know whether we have a illness, right? We just know uncomfortable about it. So what do we do? We get it checked out. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we get it checked out, we actually can rule out whether it's really an illness or not. Um, well, if it, it gets rocked to be a illness, then at least we know that we can then explore what are the next solutions. But if it's an illness, then getting treatment early, finding uh, what are some helps, whether you need medication or you, there are certain therapies that can help you, really get you to start uh, a recovery process and getting back to the normal um, part of ourselves. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sopnin. Seeking help early is really very important, right, uh, from what uh, so me has mentioned, you know, when you actually identify certain signs and symptoms early, right, do go and seek professional help, if possible, with your loved ones and family. So um, we actually have a question from Ashley. Uh, what would be your words of encouragement for those struggling with mental illness? Yeah. Um, mental illness, as any illness, is a illness that needs treatment and can be treated. So actually, the most important thing is really to um, get it treated. And anybody who's going through any difficulties is really to not sit with that struggle. It's actually very struggling. I've seen uh, people who have been enduring it for the longest time. Um, actually, it's really tough. Um, if it's difficult, then let's get some help and get it going so that the person need not struggle and suffer further. So getting treatment is really an important um, part of it. Um, and I've seen people who get it treated and they recover. It, it can be recovered. So I think a lot of people are very are very fearful of the stigma because they feel like once they are have been diagnosed with mental illness, it's the end. It's like the end of their life. Uh, the whole world will shun them. But the point here is, uh, they can they can uh, recover and they can lead normal lives. And the earlier they get it attended, the earlier they probably can reach the point of normalizing as well as getting back to their normal life. So and that that, that is uh, how to get out their difficulties and struggles and and. Um, I'll say suffering, actually. Thanks, Ognin. I uh, hope that answers your question, Ashley. Yeah, uh, we have another question by Shamini. Yeah, so does seeking medical advice for a suspected mental health condition actually leave a black mark uh, on your record for your future, looking for jobs? My understanding is actually um, the mental health professionals um, have done a lot of work in around the HR context. Actually, right now, there has been already an application being um, done in such that you do not have to give a record or a report that you have sought mental health treatments. Um, HR uh, out, out there is actually uh, being, being encouraged to not put in under their interviews, you have to ask this question. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer actually a practice to ask a HR questions, have you sought mental health treatments? If that happens, you can don't answer. This is actually being advocated. But we need more people to advocate this, to able to um, not um, discriminate those who are really having mental illness because it's just a illness just as any other illness that we have. Would you ask a person, do you have a diabetes in your work? Would you have heart attack? Um, yeah, I don't think we really go into a lot of this very specific illness to check them. So I guess this is uh, the, the, uh, the future going forward on this matter. Thanks for that, uh, Sognin. Right? Um, like what Sognin has mentioned, earlier this year, TAFEM and uh, the Ministry of Manpower actually uh, started to remove the disclosure clause of your past mm. psychiatric history or the disclosure of your past medical histories. So that uh, I think this is really one uh, positive step towards uh, removing stigma and discrimination against workplace mental health. Right? Uh, we have another question by RT. Can we have the question from Arti? Right, so Arti asks, how would you persuade someone in need of medical intervention to go and get it? Uh, if he comes from a broken family with your financial or other support for this sort of thing, yeah. So how can we actually convince someone to actually seek help? Probably any one of you want to take this question? I think 
that's why, right? I think the thing that there's so many outlets out mm. there, you know, some are pro bono, you know, some are offer a very cheap rate, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. It's just whether you really go and research on them or not. For example, you see, like, uh, Ming Siu himself, he's on campus side, right? So, mm-hmm. He already provides, you know, support on campus. Mm-hmm. And I, I know that a lot of schools, right, currently they have their sitting counsellors, mm-hmm. right? You can also approach them. They are absolutely free, to, right? I, I mean, yes, right? Yes. Right, so, and what is great is also they can, you know, refer you to the different institutions or any part of, uh, any organizations that can help. So, the important thing is to actually start reaching out to the nearest possible person and not be worried that it's going to be too expensive or anything. And one fun fact that I learned is also recently, um, the GPs, right, they also study very hard now, right? And because, you know, mental health is so common these days, you can actually go to see a GP, if you feel like you have a mental health condition. So I think overall, right, we have really improved as a society yeah. to make the treatments affordable and, you know, really widely available yeah. for anyone. Go and find out. Yeah. <laughs> Just to add on to what Sylvia has mentioned, right, now uh, the GPs are actually trained in actually uh, psychiatric assessment. So if you, uh, if you want to go to your nearby polyclinics or even the community hospitals, you can actually go and seek help without going to any specific uh, mental health hospitals. Yeah. Mm. Okay, next up. Okay, we have some questions from the parents, right? Right. Yes, I can. Okay, Gayatri, yes. as a parent, yes. what are some of the key concerns or queries you have for the youth uh, or mental health professionals in supporting your children or youths uh, out there who might be in distress or struggling with mental conditions. Okay, um, uh, I'm speaking on as a, on behalf of all the mothers out there. So you uh, you would understand when I say that as mothers, as as fathers, we also go to primary school, then we go to secondary school, then we go to tertiary school along with our kids. So when they struggle with their PSLE, we also struggle. But what happens when they are in primary school? They're open. They come and say, Dad, Mom, this is what happened today. My teacher scolded me or my teacher uh, gave me a uh, star. So there is more communication with the, our, our kids there. But as they go to secondary school, the conversation goes to mm, uh, uh, or silence. So we have started learning. The parents, we, as parents, we have started learning a new language altogether a parent-child language Hmm. in the secondary school. And then in tertiary school, again, we become better listeners. And we try to get our help through our own other parents, try not to make it a bigger uh, issue, but try to be understanding and all. But as a mother, as a woman, uh, we usually would like to say more things. Like right now also, I'm talking a lot. (laughs) Is Because as females, we would like to talk the same thing might be two times, three times. And my son has said, Mommy, that's it. I do understand. So I would like to ask Ryan, because he's uh, the same age as my son, like, how would you like your mom, dad, or your grandparents to support you in practical terms? We are being trying to be a good listener. We are trying to learn the language. We are trying to also show some interest in the games and the violent games and all sometimes <laughs> that uh, the youth play. And we are trying to be a game into that. But what are the practical things that you feel that the moms, dads, and the grandparents would uh, behave in a better way so that you don't have a mental issue, but because of them constantly asking you, do you have an issue? Do you have an issue? <laughs> then you say, yes, I have an issue. So how to avoid that? How can we... Can you support the parents? My question is how you all can support the parents and grandparents. It's in the other way around. So that we support you. Wait, sorry, your question is how can we help? Help the parents to understand how what's going support. on to you oh, okay. so that we can then, give better support to you guys. Well, I think it's important to, as teens, we are growing up. We are trying to find what is our place in this world. Mm. So we're going through somewhat of an identity crisis mm. and I think you know for parents what you all can do to help is just let us know that you're there mm. we we need our space we are trying to learn how to be independent how to grow up and live in this world without uh, support from you know a, a parental figure and to better help us just let us know that you are there we need to know that we have a safety net to fall back on mm. if times get tough 
But at the same time, you also need to learn how to experience how this world is like. You need to go through all the ups and downs. We need to learn to be independent, to take care of how to take care of ourselves. So how parents can help, let us know that you are a safety net that we can fall back on if we need it. Yeah. Very good. Oh, Thank you. That's very important, right? Uh, really, parents need to actually gain the trust also uh, oh. from your children so that they know that you know uh, you are actually a safe space for them or a safe figure for them to actually look out to uh, and to seek help to. Yes. Thank you so right. much. Okay, guys, do you have any more questions for our use? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so me in the mental professional. Yeah. Um, I think I saw a question there earlier, right, by right. someone called Vincent. I think he mentions also, right, uh, how do parents spot the symptoms or signs of children who may suffer mm. mentally at an early stage, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm. how, how... This is between you guys. I'm just reading my <laughs> question. <laughs> yes. Thanks, David, for that. So probably something as a mental professional, do you want to actually take this question? Um, how does uh, a parent really note whether the uh, young person has developed something that's of concern, right? Mm. Uh, I think a very... E uh, quite distinction signs, uh, I think, would be whether the functions have been affected. And we are talking about, uh, we're talking about is a youth uh, that goes to school or a youth that works. Now, if going to work becomes a problem, going to school becomes a problem, uh, or in the working process, um, the concentration is affected, uh, where you know that that was not like that. The person was able to go through normal days of work, studies, but somehow for a period of time, it started developing a change in behaviors. Uh, I think it's a good um, chance to check in to find out what is happening. Why is the behavior changing? Um, is there something that's developing? Is there something that's really troubling that's causing this behavior to change? And uh, not to judge. Why, why are you um, like behaving so lousy? No, it's not about that. It's about just being very factual. Uh, I, I noticed. I noted that you have been sleeping really late recently, and you cannot go to school. How come? So you're not judging uh, why it's sleeping late. You don't say why you're so lazy not going to school. Now that is a no-no. But if you're saying just observation of the, of the young person being late, uh, waking up late or sleeping late, and you're observing the person is sleeping at 4 a.m., I think that's a very factual way to, board, to bring up a concern and find out whether there are issues that are affecting sleep, uh, there are issues that is affecting their mental health, they are worrying very often, they are having anxieties, and therefore it's affecting sleep and therefore affecting also their functioning. So when there's a change in behavior, I think it's a good chance to check in and find out what's happening. Just to build on what uh, Somin has mentioned, right? If let's say you actually observe that your friends, loved ones or family members uh, have actually a change in behavior, attitudes, uh, or even like, for example, you know, they start to withdraw themselves uh, from the family members or even loved ones for a period of about uh, two weeks or even a month or so, right? Then probably uh, mm. it, it's time to actually uh, accompany your friend or loved one to go and seek help. Uh, as long as it actually um, actually affects the function of your daily functioning. Yeah, yeah. right. And just to add on that, uh, when we ask the questions and finding out what's happening, it's really to listen. Um, oftentimes, I think a lot of parents or uh, friends, when they ask questions, and then their friends or family members start saying, sharing things that are disturbing them, like maybe they're hearing voices, or uh, they, are, they are very anxious, uh, or they are um, having very uh, certain forms of thinking. Uh, and the parents or the friends get a little bit um, unsure what to do, or fearful of what they hear. They will try to tell them, no, it's nothing about that, no, it's all in your mind, try not to think about it. But by doing so, we could be denying their experiences. Definitely, it's not you who are experiencing it, it's this young person. So we really need to listen now. And just being there for them, uh, empathizing as well as listening and acknowledging that they probably are going through these experiences. And the next thing then is, what can we do to help you to remove these difficult experiences? Because nobody wants to sit with these experiences that are disturbing. And that is the part to start thinking about how can we get help. Yeah. So a few possible areas that therefore is to go and seek medical assessment. Uh, of you have um, community health services out there, or you are in the school, then seek help with the uh, counselors in the school. Right. Uh, I have a point here. Now, nowadays, most of the parents are working. So uh, in the office, you have your KPI, you have your projects, you have your deliverables and all. Often, work come and we are working from home now. What more? 
So you have your KPI, you have your projects and all. And at times, we behave uh, unconsciously, we behave the same, similarly with our kids. Like, you know, you also have only within two min, uh, meetings, you have to open up, reveal your issues, come up with solutions and all that. So sometimes as parents also, we need to uh, remove our hat of working, mom, working dad. And we need to be just simply a simple mom or simple dad without any KPI. Even if you take two meetings, three, three, not even meetings, the word meetings itself is wrong. One discussion, two discussion, and maybe uh, it is not apparent that you have uh, progressed much, but in reality, you might have progressed in the child's mind. Yeah. So certain things, are, are you don't have the verbal dialogue as such, but just being there and no deliverables, nothing, just chit chat with your child. I think that will help the child and the parent. That's my belief. Like, you know, just listen, give positive vibes and believe. Many a times we give out our fear of them not getting a GPA, of not be, uh, being as good as your friend's child. That fear in our mind we transmit to the child without even saying that. But the child recognizes the mom's words, the dad's words. So I think if we can discipline ourselves, meditate ourselves to not show that part to the child and just open, have some nice laughter, some fun, watch Tom and Jerry cartoon or what, I think that is good to build up beautiful memories together. So it will help when if you have any issue, mental issue, physical issue, any issue to just share with your parent, your grandparents or even your uh, siblings, you know, the elder sister, elder brother, the cousins. There's so many people around you, your neighbors, your friends. You can just raise it with them uh, because we spend so much time with all this uh, uh, video, with Internet and all this thing. Just sitting next to this person and ch just chit chatting. I think that is uh, the percentage of that is going down nowadays. So we need to do that. And yeah, trying to do that now with Zoom and all that, with all the restrictions. But we are trying. Yeah. I think that is the positivity. Thanks that for that, Gayatri. Have. It's so yeah. important, right, uh, for parents to actually spend quality time with their children, mm -hmm. right? So as to find out more, what are some of their uh, struggles or their emotional struggles that they're facing? I think we have a question from Clement, right? Uh, in order to be able to talk about emotional problems, uh, we need to be equipped with the language to do so. So what are, so what are the panel's thoughts about the emotional literacy of our children or youth in our local scene? Yeah. Yeah. Do the youth want to share us? Yeah, our youth, our Gen Z. <laughs> yes. Okay, wait, I'm trying to understand the question. What is the emotional literacy of you guys? Yeah. What is the state? Emotional literacy. Yeah. Very cheap question. Yeah. It's a very cheap question. Is that a way to simplify it? I think maybe I yeah. can share a little bit. I think I, I kind of understand because. You know, um, maybe millennials, we're not that young, or mm. we're not that old. So we're kind of stuck in the between, you know, when mm -hmm. all these things is coming yeah. up. So I would say that probably, uh, maybe you are saying 10 years ago, it was very hard to open up to my parents yep. mm. when I was depressed. I was, number one, scared. Mm. Number two, thought I was going to die. You know? And number three, thought my parents going to be angry with me. You know, there are a lot of things. And I think in Asian context, right, Clement, uh, to answer your question, I think it is inevitable that there are some families which don't show love. Yep. Mm. Right? And I happen to grow up in that kind of family where there is no I love you, there are no hugs. Like the fact that they are there is very good already, <laughs> right? So in that kind of uh, context, I think for me to open up that I had depression was extremely tough. Mm -hmm. mm. And it was quite a cool bar. But I would say probably in the current context, uh, it would be, I think we are more accepting in a sense. And mm. I think like you shared, right? Yes. You guys are really trying now, <laughs> right? Because now we know so much more about yes. this topic. You know, parents are more willing to try. Mm. So I, I do have a couple of friends who are uh, also find it hard to share with their parents. Mm. But I think what's interesting is also, you know, there are different people. It doesn't have to be your parents. Yes. Right? So for me, right? Yeah, the, the thing is, I open up to my auntie first because, mm. you know, she's like the cool aunt in the family. Right. So rather than go to my parents and face any yes. form of judgment, right, I go to my cool aunt first. And because cool aunt is cool, she says like, hmm, I think it might be a mental <laughs> illness. I will figure it out first. 
and then I will tell your parents for you. Mm. Yeah. So that really, really helped. Mm. So I think emotional literacy it really depends on you, how your family works. Yeah. But I'm quite sure that in every family, there's going to be one adult that you feel you can trust. Or even if it's not an adult, maybe if it's your sibling, that might help as well. You know, just mm. pass on the message. Yeah. What do you feel? <laughs> right. Okay, now I understand the question better. Um, in my household, actually, I'm mm. closer to my mom. Mm. My um, my dad, we're not as close. Um, Nobody is close to their dad, so don't, yeah. don't feel okay. sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was raised in a very typical Asian household. You know, you don't go to your parents when you are in trouble, or, as in growing up. You don't tell, you don't share to them about your, your emotions, your feelings, and all this. And so he was raised in that type of environment. And so when it came to raising me, you know, my mom was always the emotional one, the one that um, I would turn to confide to. And my dad was, you know, the one that was just there. And, you know, in a sense, I didn't, growing up, I didn't really know whether he actually um, cared, in a sense. Mm. Yeah, he didn't really talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. That was the thing. Every time I was going through a tough time, it would always be me and my mom in my room. And we just talk it out. My dad, I didn't know where he was. He was maybe outside and all this. And, you know, I think, you know, as a society, as a society, it's time for us to break that chain of sons not being able to confide in their fathers. Mm. You know, we've, we've been in this chain for so long. It's always been like this. Like Siva said, nobody <laughs> talks to their father. Yeah. And we've kind of accepted it. In a sense, and I don't think it's a good thing to accept that. I think, you know, okay, personally speaking, if you're a father and if you if you have a son, reach out to them, talk to them, ask them how they're doing. It's gonna be very awkward, honestly. At, whenever my dad talks to me, um, it's really very awkward. I don't really know how to talk to him in a sense. But um, you like it, right? Secretly, quite comforted, I, right? I mean, I guess, <laughs> but still. You know, my responses to him will always be like one word, two words, yeah. Uh, how are you doing in school? Good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, no, it's time to bridge that gap. Yeah. Right, you know, right. learn to talk for fathers, learn to talk to your sons. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I thought to do. I think um, what, what Guan has mentioned is so important, right? Uh, for males or for guys in general to actually speak up about your emotional challenges, be it if you're a father or be it if you're a son. You know, just actually open up and share with each other. Yeah. Mm. And can I uh, yeah, jump sure. in a bit Sorry. on that? I think a lot of parents as well. I think uh, also on the website, there are a lot of comments about parents still feeling very scared about seeing their child mm. uh, having certain issues. Um, now, parents need help too because they are also unsure what's happening. And sometimes it's actually okay for parents to go and seek help first uh, on behalf of the child. Uh, maybe it's good to look out a uh, community service or check with a, check with a counselor first. Um, and find out, is this okay to do this with my child? Can I ask my child this question? How can I get my child to go and seek help? Before they themselves go and respond with a shock um, face or um, being so fearful, keep telling the child, no, I don't think you are having any problem at all. You know, um, Instead, look at their own emotions. If they are feeling fearful about what's happening, they themselves get help. Yep. And then they can get the, bring the help to their child as well. So that is one way actually to bring the, the help across. Uh, I would like to also uh, say on behalf of all the parents out there, on behalf of them, I would like to uh, ask Sylvia and Gran also to take effort to communicate with the parents. Sometimes parents are alone, you know. <laughs> yeah, parents also need to be hugged. Parents also <laughs> need to have those WhatsApp messages that great job, yeah. Parents also need something, you know. It is grandparents also need uh, not just once a week call or meeting them once in a while. No, go take effort. How much effort do you take for a GPA of four? How much effort do you take for a project to get A? You, how many consultations do you meet with the uh, with the tutor? I, as a tutor, I see the passion in my students. Great, go for it. But I ask them when your mom comes to home. Did you ask your mom how was your day? Do you want a cup of water, cup of tea? I mean, whatever tea I can prepare, whatever tea you can prepare, <laughs> uh, not the fantastic one. But can can also the youth, so that the parents, grandparents support you, also take steps, just like how you would do 
uh, how you're passionate about your projects, about your pets, about your friends, about your video games. Also try to see today, let me go back and speak to, your, to my dad, to my mom, to my grandparents. Just say, hey, hi, how are you? I love you. <laughs> Why can't this be also said by the youth? I mean, parents are doing, we are doing our best, yeah. We touch our, I touch my heart and say, on behalf of all the parents, we are doing our best. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we are lost. We talk to our colleagues. I talk to her, Togin, mm -hmm. she's my colleague. And I talk to her, hey, what to do uh, about this? So we are also trying our best. But I, I personally feel that youth can do much more also because you also have so much more things you're exposed compared to the parents, I dare say. So please, I appeal to you to, uh, Today, tonight, go back and just say hello to your parents. Yeah, just hello. <coughs> How are you? They may think some mental issue. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, my son is asking, How are you? So, so be it. So be it. But I think it's a baby steps over a period of time. We must take It's not just the parents coming, but also the children coming together. And that's the meeting of minds. Yeah. I strongly believe in that. Yeah. No, actually, I, I do agree with you. Yeah. I think in a, in a strange way, right? Yeah. Because of my depression, I became much closer to my mm. parents. I think it's because, like I say, right, we were in a very uh, non-loving, uh, physically non-loving <laughs> family. And I think because I saw that my parents truly actually cared for me during that period, and it was so tough for them, I think uh, one fun thing that came out of my depression is that me and my parents became wonderfully close after yeah, it. Mm. I think, but it, I, I do feel as a youth, right? You always feel, oh my goodness, mom and dad, biggest enemy. I think it's just a normal thing. Yes. It's only until suddenly a big mm. thing happens and yep. you realize, oh my goodness, they are really here for me. They really love me. Yes. And it's because of that that I truly open up to them. And wow. now we have a great relationship. Mm. So I would say that, you know, for those of you who are feeling any mental health issues, right? You don't have to be afraid. I know you're afraid because I was. Yeah. Mm. I really feel like they were my enemy. Right. Really. <laughs> Because they're so not cool somehow, you know what I mean? Uh, and, but I think the fact is, yeah, when I had problems, they were really the one for me. And because of that, it really helped the entire family relationship. So you know what? You, you should open up to your parents and uh, try, you know, really just try to speak to them. And you'll be surprised, you know. Mm. Some dads are actually quite cool. Yep. Some moms, they are already naturally cool. <laughs> yeah. hey, Gwen, do you want to on? I mean, okay, just to make it clear. Um, <laughs> Yes, I've told my mom I love you a lot of times. Many, many, many times. Yay! <laughs> many times. But my dad, to this day, I think, to, um, from what I can remember, I've only said I love you to him once. Okay. I love you to him once. And that was um, after we were going through a course by Adam Cool. So it was about, um, how it was during um, my O-level period. Mm. So we were preparing on how to, you know, do all the notes. And then at this point, section of the training so they also taught, taught taught us how to appreciate your parents yeah and mm. they gave us this opportunity to go up on stage in front of them after the whole training ended and to say a few words about um to, to thank them uh. to and them. that was my dad went there my mom was at work i didn't expect for him to be there i was very surprised that he was there mm. honestly i wrote the entire script to for my mom expecting that she would be there but oh. she wasn't she was at work and it was my dad there instead mm. so it took a lot of courage I, it, it took a lot of courage to go onto that stage and to actually talk to him one-on-one -on -one, because i've never done it before i've mm. never spoken to him face to face you know just open up right. just share my feelings to him and it was very scary because not only was i doing something i've never done before okay. i was doing it with spectators watching me the whole <laughs> school was there and so I was opening my heart to him. I told him that I love him in front of the whole school. Wow. So, wow. yeah, it's, it is not easy. It's <laughs> so ridiculously awkward. Mm. And the car ride back was so ridiculously awkward. We didn't say anything to each other. Yeah, but, you know, I feel like, yeah, it was a good experience. Um, I have no regrets telling him that I love him. Mm. The car ride was really very awkward. We didn't say anything to each other, but I think he knows. I think he knows that I love him and I know that he loves me, even though we don't Salim. say it. Yeah. Thank you. Salim. Right. Thanks for that, Grant. Thanks, mm. Sylvia. And Gayatri and Tom Lin, really. Yeah. Um, I think really that, that communication going on between parents and also with <laughs> their children and youth is so important, right? 
many a times, you know, we just need to actually uh, share our challenges and so that our parents will know, know what uh, our children or our youth are actually going through. Because they do love each other. We mm -hmm. love, love each other. Just that, you know, we need to actually communicate this out. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. We, uh, we're having such a good time here, right? But uh, we only have 10 more minutes, oh. right? So as really? we wrap up, can we have each of our panelists share some words of encouragement or quotes to fellow youths and parents out there? Yeah. Who would like to start first? Nothing. <laughs> okay. Um, let, me, let me start. I think I um, really want to uh, say to all the youths out there, I think it's a different world now and every day it's evolving. And uh, you guys are in um, really a hit of the moment of uh, various challenges. However, the resources are there, and um, please, please do not be afraid of seeking help because there are help available. And uh, when you seek help, um, the help that comes in will enable uh, to move um, out from where it was. It can be tough. Um, and and for parents too, uh, do not be afraid. If your child, your uh, seeing that your child may be going through difficulties, there are also resources out there to help you. So the best way is all to start the conversation, to talk about it. Um, and then we can have resources coming in uh, to form the network of, of helps to everyone and to, to continue to create that resilience and a bouncing back um, for everyone as well. Thanks, thanks for that, Sonia. How about Gayatri? Okay, uh, my message goes to all the parents, grandparents there, and uh, I also to the youth. Uh, to the children there, to the to the students that I teach also, is always take the first step, take the first baby step to say hello, to ask how are you. These very basic things that we learn in the kindergarten. Say thank you, sorry, excuse me. These are the very basic things, but they help in the starting a conversation. So what is missing nowadays is this conversation between parent and child, not as much as we want. Because I'm hesitating, the child is hesitating. But actually, we are communicating a lot mentally. Yeah, the words are going to each other. So I would like to uh, um, appeal to uh, the youth and to the parents to communicate, to believe in each other, because actually, there's a lot of love there. So build a bank full of beautiful memories, beautiful memories that you can recall and smile, even when there is a very stressful situation in office or in personal life. So build beautiful memories. And for that, there should be a meeting of minds. And you cannot clap with one hand. You need both hands to clap. So I appeal to both the parents and the youth to come together. And all with working from home and home-based learning, you have more opportunities. Please take that opportunity to a good use. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gayatri. Sylvia. Whoa, my <laughs> turn. OK, I think I just want to bring the messaging back to beyond the name. Right. So at the end of the day, what we're trying to do here is we are trying to anti-stigmatize, you know, mm -hmm. the health, mental uh, health disorders, mental illness. Right. So uh, just a word of encouragement to anybody who, you know, is facing this kind of thing. I think um, I know personally because I've experienced it that you can say the society, the stigma, you know, at workplace, there's stigma. But I think a lot of times what we don't talk about is the self-stigma that we put on mm -hmm. ourselves mm -hmm. and okay. that um is something that is the biggest roadblock of all because if you're stigmatizing yourself and i did that before immediately among my peers i told myself oh my goodness you suck i mean i suck right i suck why can't i deal mm. with it better than my peers why everybody is okay doing their old levels mm. why am i depressed i'm lousy i suck i'm a loser i don't want to do anything so i think that mentality will stop you from seeking help. That mentality will be a great uh, roadblock for your road to recovery. So you have to fight that and tell yourself now, I should not stigmatize myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I should understand that this is uh, just a disease, just like a fever, just like a flu. Mm -hmm. And I should really open up to seek help. Be it your parents, be it your friends, you know, be it your peers, or be it you go straight to a healthcare professional, yeah. right? So don't be afraid to seek help. I think at a point in time, you have to realize uh, you cannot be so egoistic. You can't deal with things yourself. Mm -hmm. Then you really must be open to that option, you know, to ask other people, to tell other people your situation. And you'll be surprised, I'm telling you, because I was surprised. People around me were encouraging. Mm -hmm. And that is why um, you see 
you usually see a very happy me and most people wouldn't know that i actually had a severe clinical depression right with ocd and rage disorder when i was younger right mm. i think it takes a lot for somebody who is facing issues to open up but please do and please be brave you are really not alone yeah well thanks for that so well mm. i mean i think my pan other panelists have already mentioned a lot of other things and there isn't really much that i can add on but i want to specifically talk to those that are face are going through maybe some struggles or are facing some mental health conditions it is hard no one is denying it it is hard and mm -hmm. sometimes even the word hard is an understatement it seems impossible mm -hmm. to get through it to get to the next day but i think what is important is that you do not give up mm -hmm. honestly do not give up you mm -hmm. have even though you don't realize it you have more strength in you than you actually think you do your friends can see it talk to them seek help like um, what Sok Nin said mm. talk to those people that make you feel safe mm. that help you feel comfortable that do not judge you for being yourself mm. and always keep fighting do not give up yeah yeah mm. just nice yeah. thanks Grant. thanks Silver. thanks Gayatri and thanks Sok Nin. right once again a big thank you to our esteemed panelists for sharing your insights and online viewers uh, who have been with us throughout the whole session. Uh, we hope that you had a better understanding of the stresses that our youth face and important tips on how as a community, parents, peers, mental professionals can provide emotional support to our youth who are in distress. Before we go, we would like to leave you with three key messages. Uh, speak to your loved ones or seek professional help early. So do seek help early or speak to someone about your mental health someone that you're actually close to that you can really trust it can be your friend it can be your family member or it can be your partner or your loved one right uh second message you are not alone right while we may be in difficult times during this COVID, uh we are not alone there is community of support readily available we are able to overcome together the community of support helps one in recovery as well as early identification of mental conditions so this can be your family members your loved ones or uh your friends right and last but not least, the third message, like what Silver mentioned about stigma, right? The whole Beyond the Label campaign is about anti-stigmatization, mm. right? This fight against mental health stigma continues to prevent people from seeking help uh, for their mental health conditions, right? Sometimes the strongest stigma, like what Silver mentioned, uh, that exists is the one that we hold against ourselves. So self-stigma prevents and delays the process of getting help. But I think as a society, as a community, as uh, Singaporeans, you know, we can actually uh, be more open and be more uh, accepting and inclusive in terms of uh, people whom we know who are struggling with mental health conditions. Right. We would also like to share with you some available mental health resources and helplines that might be helpful mm -hmm. for you. Right. So it's not all just talk only. Right. The National Care Hotline, right, which actually uh, operates daily from 8 a.m. to 12 midnight. Uh, and these are operated by mental health professionals. Right. Uh, they, they can be psychologists, counselors, or even psychiatrists. Right. Uh, and the IMH helpline, it's 24 7, right? Just like the A and E. And then, of course, if uh, you have mm. friends or people whom you know that actually have suicide ideation or who are attempting suicide, the SOS helpline is also 24 7. And of course, during uh, office hours, there's the Silver Ribbon Singapore hotline, there's the Touch Community Services helpline, uh, chat, the uh, community health assessment team. They also have a live web chat service. And then, of course, the Singapore Association for Mental Health. They also have uh, their help lines, which is during 9 to 6, during office hours. And of course, how can we miss Bell, the Beyond the Label help board, right? That actually connects uh, people who need help with uh, the different mental health resources that are out there, right? So do also follow us, like what Tuva mentioned, on our Youth Alliance and Beyond the Label social media pages on our FB and IG. If you would like to learn more about mental health conditions and stigma surrounding it, so the Youth Alliance has also specially curated the e-escape room that seeks to educate the public on the various mental illnesses like depression, OCD, schizophrenia, and eating disorders through an immersive virtual experience. For those of you who would like to try out the e-escape room, here's the link for your reference. <laughs> Once again, thank you for tuning in and have a blessed evening. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, you, guys.